I, Silverdean Emblem O'Neill, familiarly known to my family, friends, and acquaintances as Blimmy, because the burden of my years and infirmities is heavy upon me, and I realize the end of my life is near, do hereby bury my last will and testament in the mind of my master. He will not know it is there until after I am dead. Then, remembering me in his loneliness, he will suddenly know of this testament, and I ask him to inscribe it as a memorial to me. I have little in the way of material things to leave. Dogs are wiser than men. They do not set great store upon things. They do not waste their time hoarding property. They do not ruin their sleep worrying about how to keep the objects they have and to obtain the objects they have not. There is nothing of value I have to bequeath except my love and my faith. These I leave to all who have loved me. To my master and mistress, who I know will mourn me the most. To Freeman, who has been so good to me. To Sin and Roy and Willie and Naomi and... But if I should list all who's lo who have loved me, it would force my master to write a book. Perhaps it is vain of me to boast when I am so near death, which returns all beasts and vanities to dust. But I have always been an extremely lovable dog. I ask my masters and mis master and mistress to remember me always, but not to grieve for me too long. In my life, I have tried to be a comfort to them in time of sorrow and a reason for added joy in their happiness. It is painful for me to think that even in death I should cause them pain. Let them remember that while no dog has ever had a happier life, and this I owe to their love and care for me, now that I have grown blind and deaf and lame, and even my sense of smell fails me so that a rabbit could be right under my nose and I might not know, my pride has sunk to a sick, bewildered humiliation. I feel life is taunting me with having overlingered my welcome. It is time I said goodbye, before I have become too sick a burden on myself and those who love me. It will be sorrow to leave them, but not a sorrow to die. Dogs do not fear death as men do. We accept it as a part of life, not something alien and terrible which destroys life. What may come after death? Who knows? I would like to believe, with those of my fellow Dalmatians who are devout Mohammedans, that there is a paradise where one is always young and full-bladdered, where all the day one dillies and dallies with an amorous multitude of houris beautifully spotted, where jackrabbits that run fast but not too fast, like the houris, are as the sands of the desert where each blissful hour is mealtime, where in long evenings there are million of fireplaces, logs forever burning, and one curls oneself up and blinks into the flames and nods and dreams, remembering the old brave days on earth and the love of one's master and mistress. I am afraid that this is too much for even a dog such as I am to expect. But peace, at least, is certain. Peace, and a long rest for weary old heart and head and limbs, and eternal sleep in the earth I have loved so well. Perhaps after all this is best. One last request I earnestly make. I have heard my mistress say, when Blemmy dies, we must never have another dog. I love him so much, I could never love another one. Now, um, I would ask her, for love of me, to have another. It would be a poor tribute to my memory never to have a dog again. What I would like to feel is that having once had me in the family, 
now she cannot live without a dog. I've never had a narrow, jealous spirit. I've always held that most dogs are good. And one cat, the black one I have permitted to share the living room rug with me during the evenings, whose affections I have tolerated in a kindly spirit and in rare, sentimental moods, even reciprocated a trifle. Some dogs, of course, are better than others. Dalmatians, naturally, as everyone knows, are best, so I suggest a Dalmatian as my successor. He can hardly be as well-bred or as well-mannered or as distinguished or handsome as I was in my prime. My master and mistress must not ask the impossible. But he will do his best, I am sure, and even his inevitable defects will help, by comparison, to keep my memory green. To him I bequeath my collar and leash, and my overcoat and railroad raincoat, made in order, made to order in nineteen twenty nine at Herme in Paris. He can never wear them with the distinction I did, walking around the Place Vendome, or later along Park Avenue, all eyes fixed on me in admiration. But again, I, I am sure he will do his utmost not to appear a mere gauche provincial dog. Here on the ranch, he may prove himself quite worthy of comparison in some respects. He will, I presume, come closer to the Jack Rabbits than I have been able to in recent years. And uh, for all his faults, I hereby wish him the happiness I know will be his in my own home. One last word of farewell, dear master and mistress. Whenever you visit my grave, say to yourselves with regret, but also with happiness in your hearts at the memory of my long happy life with you. Here lies one who loved us and whom we loved. No matter how deep my sleep, I shall hear you. And not all the power of death can keep my spirit from wagging a grateful tale.